This is the Tom Hartman Program. Welcome back. Tom Hartman here with you. Uh, Last week, the New York Times published an article about how uh, 111, the families of 111 dead football players, NFL players, over a period of, uh, I believe it was... uh, maybe a decade, it was, it was some time. This was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Uh, the brains here are from players who died as young as 23 and as old as 89. Quarterbacks, running backs, linebackers, even a place kicker and a punter. Famous players, not famous players, just a whole bit, 44 linemen, 20 running backs, 17 defensive backs, 13 linebackers, seven quarterbacks, five wide receivers, two tight ends, a place kicker and a punter. It's starting to sound like You know, five golden rings and a partridge and a pair. Anyway, uh, that's that was the list. And uh, Dr. Ann McKee, who is a neuropathologist, that is a pathologist, a person who looks at dead tissue, neuro, a person who looks at nervous system stuff, you know, a neuropathologist looking at at uh, the, the cause the, or the, 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 the progression of disease as a pathologist in the brain. And she's examined the brains of 202 deceased football players. Of those 202 players, 111 of them played in the National Football League, the NFL. And of those 111 who played in the NFL, 110 of them had chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Chronic mean it's, you know, repeating over and over throughout a long period of time. Traumatic, you know, trauma damage from, you know, trauma, excuse me, and encephalopathy, encephalopathy is um, the, uh, the, the increase in, in uh, fluid or pressure in the brain, and uh, this chronic traumatic encephalopathy, in other words, the, the brain gets bruised, basically, it gets struck, and, and you know, the, the, the brain kind of floats inside the skull, uh, you know, surrounded by amniotic fluid, the 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 the, the brain fluid that, that that surrounds the brain and goes down the brain st- down, goes down the, um, the spinal cord, and and when when a person hits their head, the brain goes flying into the bone, and then whips back and bounces around a little bit, and and you know it's not a good thing. And the part of the brain that impacts the the, the bone will bruise and swell. And bruising is, you know, merely a trauma process. You know, in normal skin, you get a bruise and it breaks blood vessels. And, and you have, you know, that, that famous from, from Dr. T, you know, doctors on television, subdural hematoma, right? <laughs> it's, uh, subdural meaning below the skin. <laughs> and, well, well, actually, subdura is way below the skin. Anyway, uh, that would be subcutaneous uh, hematoma would be below the skin, right? Subdural would be uh, inside the brain, I guess. But... In any case, the, 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 the bruising that happens to the brain damages the brain, and it produces this thing called chronic trauma, uh, traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, which is a degenerative disease that produces the following symptoms, confusion, depression, memory loss, and ultimately dementia. 111 out of 110 NFL, NFL, NFL players presented with this or showed this in their, in their brain autopsies. These were all, you know, dead. They were examining their brains in detail. And then they actually show some of the pictures of some of these brains. And it's really striking how much brain matter is, has, uh, you know, vanished from their brains. I mean, this is just really, really remarkable. Uh, the one, one guy, uh, Ali Matson, played 14 seasons of the NFL. He died in 2011 at the age of 80, being mostly bedridden with dementia. He said Matson hadn't spoken in four years. Uh, the, so, so anyway, the, the question that I, you know, that this presents to me is if I'm watching an NFL football game, and I, I would frankly say this goes beyond the NFL. And this is probably true of hockey and probably true of soccer, particularly given that soccer players bounce balls off their heads. And that's, that could be pretty traumatic, but I haven't seen any studies on soccer. But just to football, 
I'm sitting at home watching a football game, and I enjoy watching football, or at least I did until I read this study. I don't, you know, I'm not a big football fan. I couldn't tell you who's what in the leagues or any of that kind of stuff. But, you know, if I'm in a situation where there's a football game on TV and somebody hands me a glass of hard cider or a glass of wine or something and says, hey, you want to watch it? I can't drink beer because of the gluten, but you want, you want to, you know, or gluten-free beer? I, yeah, sure. Why not? I, I actually really enjoy watching baseball, but, you know, I've, in baseball, nobody's getting injured to the best of my knowledge. But now, when I'm watching football, I'm going to be thinking, I'm watching people lose their minds. I mean, you're, you know, if you, 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 and it's virtually every place, somebody's getting hit hard. And even if the hit isn't directly to the head, even a body blow can jerk that brain around in that little, you know, that gelatinous brain in that, in that very, very hard skull bone. And it's sort of like boxing, you know, I've, you know, we've, we've known the dangers of boxing for decades and we've known that boxers suffer brain damage and yet we still have boxing. And I, maybe you can help me with this. I don't understand why anybody would get pleasure from watching somebody else be injured. And in boxing, I mean, it's just really explicit. But in football, you know, there's a lot of people who say, you know, I, I don't like boxing. I don't watch boxing. I don't want to have anything to do with boxing. But yeah, sure, I'd love to watch a, a football game. And now we're seeing, I mean, maybe the, maybe the damage is not as severe as boxers suffer. I don't, you know, this is not a comparative study. This is just, you know, looking at football players. But 100, 110 out of 111 NFL players having um, CTE. This is not a good thing. And what it means is that if you are watching a football game, in all probability, you're watching people being, you know, having their lives destroyed, having parts of their brains destroyed. You're watching people be set up for suicide. You're watching them be set up for depression. You're watching them be set up for divorce, for, uh, you know, uh, estrangement from their families and friends as a consequence of, of mood changes and dementia. You're watching them lose, literally lose the memories of their childhood and of the rest of their lives right in front of you. And, you know, what do we do with that? How do we deal with that? Should we? I'm not sure that you can reinvent football unless we go from tackle to touch, which, you know, would not be as uh, interesting I'm not sure that we can reinvent football to, you know, to something that's less destructive to the people who play it. You know, we, we sit around and, and look at the Roman gladiators and the Roman society. I remember reading this when I was a kid, when I was like in, in elementary or junior high school, reading stories about the, the, you know, the Roman circus and how they would, uh, the, the gladiators would go out and they would fight to the death. And then, or they would, you know, battle the lions or whatever it may be. And if they survived, then the crowd or the, the emperor, depended on what era of Roman history you're looking at, because the Romans were around for quite a, you know, many hundreds of years. But then the crowd or the emperor would turn their thumb up or turn their thumb down, like John McCain did on the floor of the Senate last week. And if they turned their thumb down, they would execute the, the, the gladiator right there in the middle of the arena, right in front of everybody. And everybody would, you know, applaud as they held up his severed head or whatever they did. And I remember being shocked by the barbarity of that. You know, reading that story as a little kid and just being genuinely shocked. Oh my God, people used to live this way? This was entertainment? And now we know what is happening to football players. What does that mean? What does that say about us? What does it say about flip football? What does it say about the need for humans to have war? Now, war may not seem related to all this, but I, I have long thought that sports, particularly football, particularly the more violent sports, football and boxing, um, but particularly football, team sport, are our stand-ins for war, and that's why they're so popular, is there's something wired into our genetic makeup that caused us to wipe out every other homo species 
every other human species, and there were a bunch of them. Our, uh, one of our daughters is in town, and over the weekend with uh, her and her boyfriend and their kids, we, we went to the, or and his kids, we went to the uh, Museum of Natural History and, and uh, you know, spent a fair amount of time there. And in the, the, the David Koch section, which talks about how humans evolved and adapted because of climate change. I'm not making this up. There's a whole wall devoted to this, how climate change was so important to us. We wouldn't be here without climate change and all that kind of stuff. Climate change is good for you. Um, but anyhow, standing there in the David Koch section of the museum, I was struck by, you know, if, there, there are several human species that survived on this planet for six, seven, eight, one of them nine times longer than we have. We've only been around a couple hundred thousand years. Several of these species survived over a million years. That's success. And we wiped them out. And it's like, okay, why'd we do that? Well, it looks like maybe we have a gene for violence. We wiped out the Neanderthals. We wiped out the other homo species. Uh, we're wiping out species all over the planet right now at a mind-boggling rate. And if we have a gene, if we have a, 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 almost a need for war and violence, do we need to have a societal outlet for that? Does football actually diminish our propensity for violence? Or does football encourage it? Which I guess is the same question about, you know, uh, fringy pornography. You know, does... Pornography that depicts, uh, even even depicting it in a safe and and consensual way, that depicts, uh, you know, sexual violence, does it create more of it, or does it provide people with a release so that they don't do it? And I, you know, I don't think that the that the uh, that the science is in on that. And I would ask the same question about football: Does this make us less likely to be warriors or more likely to be warriors? So a lot of thoughts around this, but also about the lives of these. This is the Tom Hartman program. So anyhow, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. We're also, you know, compiling our list on, on the perfidities of the Trump 